celebrating the resurrection of your son Jesus Christ. It is an event, it is a moment, it is a thing that gives us more joy than we can truly, truly express to you. We thank you, we praise you, we bless you. We pray that as we consider this wondrous news today, we pray that as we consider this news that we've heard before, that you would work in our hearts anew and that you would impress upon us what this means to us, what it means for all. Be with us, Lord, to open our hearts and minds for what you have to say to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to start with a story that's probably familiar to, to very many of you by now. I read a story years ago how in the early days of communist rule in Russia, there was great, great pressure. And officials would go to great lengths to deny religion, to suppress religion of all kinds, especially what was most prominent, to really try to beat down folks from, under, or from believing in, in their Christian faith. There's a story about a particular leader who went to speak before a very large crowd. His name was Nikolai Ivanovich Bukharin, or at least something approximating that. My Russian's a little rusty. He went to speak to this very large crowd, and the subject was atheism. He's there to promote what the state believes. It is said that he spoke long, that he spoke well even, arguing vehemently at times insultingly that one should reject Christ. It's nonsense. Why would you believe such a thing? At the end of his rather lengthy speech, very confident that he had achieved his goal and persuaded everyone in the audience about the absurdity of following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he turned the meeting over to the parish priest who had assembled everybody there, who complimented him on his eloquence. He had spoken very, very well. Then the priest turned to dismiss the crowd, saying, Christ is risen! To which the crowd as one thunderously proclaimed, He is risen indeed. Amen. Here we are, arrived again on the day Christ is risen. Always, always, it's a bit of a journey to get to this point, isn't it? For most, the journey to Christ's resurrection probably begins at the beginning of Lent. It probably begins for many that way because we're so preoccupied with other things. Though, truth be told, the real journey to Easter begins long before Lent. For Easter, Jesus' resurrection was the reason that God sent His his son to the world in the first place. So we can say that the starting point for Easter is Christmas, if you want to think about it. In fact, the song that we started off with out in the prayer garden this morning, Easter people, raise your voices. Some of you might have thought, this sounds oddly familiar. Well, there are words to that tune that we sing at Christmas time. Angels we have heard on high. So you could say that the beginning of Easter is Christmas. But that is just what we see. That's just what you and I see if we think long and hard about it. Who can really say when the journey to Easter begins? What we can say is the journey to Easter begins with the love of God for all people. It begins in the mind and the heart of God. And who can say where that truly, truly began? For today, let's focus on Easter, beginning with Lent. Beginning with Lent, beginning with Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, we begin to look forward to this day. I, in fact, talking to people over the years and just uh, sensing how people feel and react when we get to Ash Wednesday, like, oh boy, here we go again. Can't we just skip ahead? head to the good part? Can't we, can't we just let this dark, dreary time go and get to the good part? We begin that day, though, to prepare ourselves for this celebration. We begin to prepare for this celebration, first of all, considering ourselves. Taking a look at what God was dealing with when He looked at humankind. As wondrous as this day is, as spectacular to behold as our Savior is, we, each and every one of us, is quite a bit less so. We considered the human condition on that Ash Wednesday as revealed in 
the Scripture. Romans 3, 10 to 12 says, As it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And from there, if you were to turn to Romans chapter 3, Paul begins to describe in even more lurid detail just how bad we are. Just how awful the normal state of humanity is. He gets very graphic in his description of our fallenness. And it's, it's not a pretty picture at all. Romans 3.23, he continues, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 6.23, we heard, hell, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of our United States, known for being able to turn a phrase, he wrote a few things that people remember even today. He, he was known to, to deal with some important things there that we hold on to today. Uh, even if he didn't always live up to the values that he was writing about, he reflected on particular issues of the day and said, Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. I submit the person who has a true understanding of the nature of man might say in all earnestness, Indeed, I tremble for myself when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Next to God, what are we? As we consider ourselves as we are and God as God is, what is there for us? What hope is there for us? Well, it turns out that there is every hope in the world and more. For though we are sinful and undeserving in any way, God loves us anyway. Amen? God loves us deeply. Jesus tells us as much. John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. What is revealed on Easter Day? What, what was Jesus doing on Good Friday? What was God doing for us despite our sin? Saving us. Saving us. If Ash Wednesday and Lent is a reminder or a wake-up call, people, you're a mess. Folks, you're in trouble. If that's what Ash Wednesday and Lent, at least in part, does, you need God, but you don't deserve it. You have no reason to expect it on your own. There is no hope. Easter is God's answer. There is hope. There is hope because I, your Heavenly Father, love you. In the words of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Now I know the prophet Jeremiah sharing that word from God was speaking to unfaithful Israel, but do they not ring just as true for us today when we consider who we are and what we are without God and we consider what God does for us despite that? He sends His Son Jesus for us who lives and dies and rises again. Do those in the words not ring as true for us? I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, gives us more understanding of this. Remember Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's just the first part of the verse. Listen to the whole verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. 
brothers and sisters, God's desire for us is eternal life. And he, he gives it. He just gives it. It's not, it's not something we have to buy or earn. It's a gift. Not a grudging gift either. It is a gift that is from the heart of God to all people. Romans 5, 8 reads, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, what must we do to receive this gift? This is a gift that is extraordinary beyond words. What must we do? How can we have it? Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What must we do to have this gift that God would have us to have? Accept it. Accept it from the hands of our loving God. Paul kind of repeats himself. He wants to make sure you understand Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. There's, there's no exceptions. Here's a special gift. It's for these people over here. Sorry, folk on, on this side. No, this gift is for everyone who will have it. Everyone who will accept it from the Father. As if that weren't enough that we are saved, that we have eternal life. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We get eternity. But think about this. We get eternity at its most blessed you can possibly imagine. This is not eternity where we're stuck with some kind of tension between us, sinful us, and a perfect holy God. No. Because Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We have peace with God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and all that could have been held against us is forgotten. Everything that we feel shame or guilt for, everything that we would hide or forget, it is all forgotten. When Mary Magdalene and later other women, still later disciples, see Jesus risen from the dead, it is a sign. Talked about that out in the prayer garden just a little bit. It is a sign. It is the proof in the flesh. Paul writes in Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters, today we have every reason to praise God, to praise Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. The journey that was begun on Ash Wednesday and through Lent has brought us to this place. It has brought us to this moment of incredible, indescribable, unspeakable joy. But what this day shows us too is that our journey is not over. In many ways, our journey has just now become, uh, begun. Because in Jesus, life as we know it is 
just beginning. Or maybe we should say, life as God would have us to have in Jesus has just begun. Jesus didn't just die that we might be forgiven our sins and have new life now. Jesus died that we might have eternal life, that we might be with God forever. Jesus is God's sign pointing to eternal life for all people. God does the unimaginable, the unthinkable for us. Our response, be sure, be sure to follow with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength and with all your soul. And praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the same way. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. I, I, before we move on to our before we move on to our psalm of praise, praising God for this, I want to go back. Joyce, Sean, Don, can we go back and let's just one more time, one time, let's.